Okay. So, um, yeah, well, sort of preparing for this uh, conversation, and I don't know how and why, but YouTube, I don't know if you go on YouTube sometimes, but, you know, it directs you to really funny places, you know. You end up watching things that you actually never intended to watch. Yeah. But um, I listened to a podcast, a conversation between uh, Ricky Gervais and Russell Brand. Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of like both of them anyway. Um, they were talking about religion, spirituality, uh, but mostly they were talking about why are we here, human beings? Why are we on this planet? Mm -hmm. And um, I've got to say, listening to some of your music, you know, some of the more ambient music uh, is always for me a time to reflect, you know, like mm -hmm. depending on the music you listen to, you, you have different moods, but your music yeah. is definitely for me a time to reflect on, on many things, life, love, kids, mm -hmm. Palestine, whatever, right? Yeah. And and actually, one of your recent albums is called Reflection, which is yep. also interesting. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's when I and, finally realized that that's what I was using my music for. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, uh, I came upon one of your songs, or one of your pieces called By This River. Mm -hmm. And some of the lyrics were like perfect for the beginning of this conversation, because it says, you know, always failing to remember why we came. Yeah. Uh, I wonder why we came. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's just me asking you the question. Why, in your opinion, are we, are we here? Well, if, if I weren't writing songs, I probably wouldn't say sentences like that because I don't think there is an answer to that question um, in the sense of there being a purpose outside of the purposes that we make. I don't, I don't believe in God, and I don't believe that there's a, there's a divine purpose or anything like that. So, so I believe we're animals that have become particularly intelligent animals, and we're capable of asking questions about our future, um, which apparently most other animals aren't able to do. We can imagine different futures. We can sort of think it could be like this or it could be like that, and what would it be like if it was like this other thing? And really, the, the progress of human thought really is, is not the process of answering why we're here, but the process of saying, what could we do now we're here? So, so it's a question of, it's a creative question, actually. It's saying, what do you think you can make of this, this situation you're in? Here you are, you're alive, uh, you have some kind of power as a human, whatever that power is, it might be a very small amount of power, it might be a lot of power, but you can make things happen differently. Or you can make things happen the same over and over again. And so I think this, this is what makes us inherently political creatures, because we are aware of having choices. Politics is about choices, isn't it? It's about moral and ethical choices. And trying to um, reimagine the world in some other way. <clears throat> and, and that's really a question of saying, uh, one of the things it is anyway, is a question of saying, where does the power lie? Who has the power? Why do they have it? Um, what do they do with it? Could it be used differently? Could I have some? Um, what will I do if I, <laughs> with it if I do? So, so there are a lot of interesting questions, but none of them are quite that question. Why are we here? I don't think that's answerable, essentially. And do you think that actually people are aware enough of the fact that we are on this planet for actually a very short amount of time? I was reading a book recently, and um, the metaphor the, the author used was that if life on Earth was a 24 hours day, we human beings would appear at the last second before mm. midnight. <laughs> and I told, I told this to my kid and he was like, wow. I was, and, you know, it's, it's quite telling, right? But do you think we overstate our importance, maybe human beings? And we forget that this is just a journey in a way, mm. right? Yes. I mean, in the, in the long flow of history, we're a very small event. 
And, uh, you know, there may have been other events like us. We don't know. Um, we don't know whether there were other periods when there were other civilizations that we've never even heard of. Um, somebody was has just written a book where he's talking about um, Gobekli Tepe, the place in um, uh, Turkey, which is one of the oldest human settlements. And so they've made some recent discoveries there that shows humans to be really quite a lot different at that time than what we imagined. Very sophisticated kind of game playing and ritualistic activities. And it seems like, um, this is an, ex an idea that is explored by David Graeber in his, the book that just came out. Um, um, it seems like human beings in the past were very experimental with, with their political and social arrangements. So the old picture we have of, you know, first there was sort of ragged bands of individual cavemen sort of wandering out and fighting each other and then they formed bigger groups and then they formed sort of little settlements and then they formed laws and you know that sense of it being a sort of progression in a straight line leading to us that's actually doesn't seem like how things happened it seems like um people have always experimented really really very vigorously with different ways of doing things and even in, it seems like in many um, earlier civilizations, there were even quite often parallel politics going on. So um, there are quite a lot of groups, particularly North American Indian groups, who had entirely different social systems in the winter than from in the summer. And sometimes they would even have different names. So the people would be called one name in the winter when it came to summer, they took another name on and everything would change between those two seasons. Um, there would be chiefs in the summer with hierarchies and slaves and so on. And then in the winter, they would all disappear. They just became foragers again. Um, so I'm, I'm only saying this to say that it is absolutely human to experiment with these things. There is not a single system that that is you know that is the right system for us and this is an important idea because the whole notion of that dreadful libertarianism that has swept the world the last few years and has i think destroyed many of the things that we built well in our civilization the whole idea of that is that there's a sort of sequence that you have to go through until you finally arrive at us and the end of history, you know, now we've sorted it out. It's capitalism and capitalist democracy. And that's the right answer. Well, I'm sorry, <laughs> that isn't going to be the end of the story. Um, and, and it's important to stress that because most of the people who argue against the things that you and I happen to be interested in, which are sort of socialistic, activistic, um, the idea that we can change things. Most of the arguments against that really are based on that other way of seeing things. No, you can't change these things. This is the right way for things to go. This is the system that will work and other ones won't work. Well, that to me is inhuman. It's human to, to try other things all the time. And I I, I think in a way there's, uh, you just said it, there's a purpose to the lie, right? Um, because if um, when you listen to people that believe that, you know, a vulture capitalism is the only way, mm -hmm. uh, they always, they'll, you know, they will always tell you that human beings at the core are individualistic, egoistic, egoistical, and they go back centuries with a sort of made up uh, past explaining yeah. that you know we've now thanks to industrialism and capitalism made this beautiful world and before you know it was savages eating each other fighting all the time <laughs> the dark and, ages yeah yes and um, in the same book uh, they go back to the myth in a way that the uh, the first 
men, women on earth, um, um, were hunters. You know, you, you often hear, uh, actually, I'm a vegetarian myself. You often hear people that are not vegetarian saying, look, we've eaten meat since we were, we were on this planet. And yes. how did they survive without hunting? But actually, hunting was only a tiny part of yes. how people ate. Yes. And, it's, and when you think about it, it's quite obvious. It's a lot harder centuries ago even to actually kill a beast when you don't even have, they didn't even have a gun than actually to you know get down and pick up a berry or something yeah. and actually women were actually the one at 70 to 80 percent feeding the family you know mm -hmm. it wasn't the you know so all these lies are serve a purpose don't you think yes of course yes and part of that purpose is in saying ultimately that purpose is to say that the way power is distributed now is is right and um in fact the only improvement on it is to make it more more of what it already is so make the rich even richer and uh create a very cheap labor force by making the rest poorer so so that's that's a brutal way of saying it and very few libertarians would admit that that's the end game but it is actually the end game if you if you really do have this kind of naive Darwinian view of why people are on the planet and how how the best futures are made, then you will come to the conclusion that it's only natural that some people become incredibly wealthy and have a huge amount of power over all the other people. And uh, it's a very ancient idea and people in power have always liked it <laughs> because it tells them they're right. And people are very easily persuaded by any theory that says to them, you're right. And you've always been right. And unfortunately, they are the ones writing the rules of the game most of the time as well, right? Very often, yes. So, so the rules change when, when it becomes obvious that the old rules don't work anymore. And... This is that moment that I always think is very interesting. And I think we're at one of those moments now. Um, the, the Russian writer, Sergei Yerchak, says this thing in one of his books that um, revolutions happen in two phases. The first phase is one when everybody realizes that something is wrong. It's not working anymore. But the second phase, and the really important part, is when everybody realizes that everybody else also realizes that. So this is the big moment when you suddenly think, hey, we're not the minority, we're the majority. And most of us don't want this system. Most of us are unhappy with it. So when that happens, I think the, the thing starts to tip the other way. It's the tipping point, you know. And I mean, I'm seeing this happening now in the discussion about Israel and Palestine, where suddenly a lot of people who used to say, oh, it's just too complicated for me. I don't understand it. I don't want to get involved. And of course, that, that inaction is very much encouraged by the people who want the situation to stay as it is. But I think more and more people are saying, Hold on, this just isn't right. This this is not this is not a difficult question. This this is a simple question. There might be lots of complexity within it, but the basic issue is pretty simple. Something is badly wrong here. I don't know if you saw um, in the last couple of days that one of the ex attorney generals of of Israel said, "I'm." very sorry to say that this is now an, uh, an apartheid state. Um, well, if an ex-attorney general can realize that, a lot of the rest of the world is realizing it as well. And it's, it's interesting what you were saying about, like, we are many, because I think it, 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 sort of, it takes a while to realize that we are many, yes. because the powers in place, in a way, once are working very hard to make us believe that we are not many, right? Yes, and, yes. and actually, um, Noam Chomsky, 
said something maybe 10 years ago. He said, like, I went to a city in the US uh, to speak at a Palestine solidarity event. But because I've traveled so much, I knew that two kilometers away, you had another Palestine solidarity kind of chapter. And mm -hmm. another 500 meters away, you had another Palestine solidarity chapter. But in a way, they didn't really know each other. So they yeah. all believed, oh, there's only five of us, when in yeah. fact, there were 50 of, of them, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, um, and I was thinking actually about Emma Watson, you know, this uh, yes. actress that came out in support of, uh, of, of solidarity with Palestine. And, um, and, and it was very interesting because I spoke to a friend afterwards. Um, you know, we, you signed a letter, or lots mm -hmm. of people signed a letter supporting Emma Watson, including you know, A-listers in Hollywood and stuff. And I spoke to a friend of mine, uh, very active, politically active on Palestine, like um, one of my best friends. And she was like, whoa, Emma Watson got demolished for taking a stand for, for Palestine. And I said, actually, she didn't. Look no. at her post. Her post was like was liked one million times. Wow! You know, one at the time, probably more now. Yeah. And actually, she was attacked by the Jewish Chronicle, the Israeli ambassador. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. So, yeah. in fact, she wasn't attacked. She was very supported. But yes. it's the way we see things that, and it's the way you tell the story. I mean, another example of that is right now is these truckers demonstrations on the Canadian border. So it's being told that this is a kind of revolution among truckers and that they're all completely insanely crazy about this mask mandate or vaccination mandate. But actually 90% of truckers agree with it. But we're not hearing that story. You know, so, so it seems like the story is that the whole of sort of American and Canadian trucking is completely at a standstill because they're so angry about vaccination. Well, only 10% of them are. And that 10% is very heavily supported by right-wing money. So unfortunately, whoever tells the story gets to define the truth. And that, that story is much more exciting in the media than 90% of people saying, no, this is fine by me. I want to be vaccinated. And I completely understand the reasons for having vaccination mandates. Um, but that isn't a story, you know, people, mm. people agreeing and being sensible and being reasonable is not a story that makes uh, the press. And, and that's all, that's obviously the role of propaganda, right? Mm -hmm. um, because like I was listening to a French sociologist who said that, you know, he's, He's actually spending time. It's not like only a, a survey or a poll over the phone. He's spending hours and hours with families and stuff, talking yeah. to them. What are your worries? You know, and most of the time, people worry today about the environment, about the fact that they can't pay their bills, yeah. about the health system. But then when you look at the surveys on TV, it's security, immigration, because the corporate media you know, is going on and on about this, you know. Yes. Um, so the way propaganda, you know, and again, Chomsky was saying that before Second World War, the US people were very pacifist. Mm -hmm. But then they had to go to war. So, I mean, I think he said it was one of the first major propaganda campaign to actually turn a very pacifist population into let's go to war. Yeah, and in yeah. six months' time, they managed to do this, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I have a word. I don't know if it will make sense to you, but I use the word propaganda. So it's the same as propaganda, but it just changes one of the A's for an E. And I think this is the, this is the great new innovation in propaganda. Propaganda used to be sort of simple. Um, the Germans are killing babies with bayonets. Just simple statements like that much, much more effective is to just set up which topics people talk about and what they think about and just leave other ones out of the conversation. That's called propaganda in my, in my vocabulary. It's, it's, it's a way of, you don't have to control the conversation then. You just create what the conversation is about and you just let it happen. 
doesn't matter if there are people who agree and disagree and all that sort of thing. The fact is, that is where their attention is. And that's the main thing. You want to get their attention, either for or against. It doesn't matter. I mean, look at what's happening with uh, Ukraine and, and Russia at, yes, the, yes. And at the moment, right? Very good example. This is This is such a stupid situation. And it seems to me that all of the media are just falling for it and again it's a good story you know tanks on the borders troops you know fireworks between political leaders it's all great stuff for the media this is this is what sells papers this is what makes people watch the news but um nobody with with some exceptions but almost nobody is saying what actually is going on there and what's the background to it um What have the Russians really said? Um, did we make a deal with them about NATO and how far NATO could extend? Did we? Yes, we did. <laughs> does, does everybody know what that deal said? Nobody bloody knows. Well, why not? That's the, that's the center of the story, you know. But um, yeah, that's a very good example of a piece of propaganda. So we're all talking about it. And what's interesting is that I was listening to the Ukraine, Ukrainian prime minister a few days ago who said, actually, hey, we're not that worried. You know, you know it's, it's okay. It's not war. And, but everybody else around him is saying it's war. We, we're on the verge to war. And, and what really sort of drives me mad is that you're saying, yes, these stories sell papers. But at the end of the day, these stories might probably kill yeah. thousands of people. Yeah. Look at Iraq, and and that's what's driving me mad. A, a few so-called leaders decide, let's let's go to war. Let's send mm -hmm. the mass to war. They're not going to lose anything. They're actually going to make money because they mm -hmm. work with the weapon industry anyway, you know, one way or another. Mm -hmm. But thousands are going to die. And yeah. that's what drives me mad, you know, about the situation. Yeah. Um, yes, it's very callous. Well, of course, I'm sure they're all thinking, you know, we can pull, we'll pull back at the last moment or they'll pull back at the last moment. And it's like a game of chicken. In fact, the other day I was leaving my house the other morning and I saw the strangest sight, which was two cars that had crashed, at, obviously at quite slow speed into each other face to face. You don't see that very often. You know, you see cars that have hit sideways on, but these two cars, And I think that was two people playing chicken. Two people, you know, each sort of saying to the other one, well, you're, you better bloody stop because I'm not going to. And neither side stopped. And these two drivers were standing there looking like, what a fucking idiot I am. <laughs> but, but this is what can happen. You know, and, and of course, the reasons that England is so active in supporting America in this. It's the same old shit of, you know, we don't see ourselves as fellow Europeans, but we do see ourselves as fellow Americans. Fuck knows why, but we do. Um, perhaps because we both speak English. Um, but of course, now you have this other thing of you have people in the Tory party who, who are trying to prove themselves because they're hoping to be the next leader. So you get this ludicrous foreign secretary, Liz Truss, going to threaten the Russians like we're a big, we're a big powerful country. You know, we're going to threaten you Russians. It's, it's apart from being totally embarrassing, it's quite dangerous. And actually, I, I don't like Putin. I don't like, you know, any of them. I don't like Russia before France, whatever, but... But I like the fact, it actually makes me laugh, that France as well, they still think they're superpower. So Macron is going to Russia. I'm going to sort this out. And he gets humiliated in Russia. And, and I still like this, sort of Putin saying, who the fuck are you, little man? You know, uh, <laughs> even though, you know, he'll make good comedy if it wasn't so tragic in a way. Yeah. yeah. But I wanted to ask you about Palestine because you, you've mentioned it. Um, And I was wondering, because I know 
it must have been a journey for you as well, you know, um, realizing what was happening in Palestine. Uh, I know, for example, a common friend, Roger Waters, I think actually played in Israel 15, 12, 13 years ago, and then realized that, wow, this is happening. So yeah. it, it's all a, a journey. I was, I spoke to you maybe three years ago now, we filming this documentary, we interviewed you in your studio with Ali, and you were saying, like right now, I'm sort of on board with BDS, but it's in a way, which is boycott, divestment and sanction. But in a way, it's a, it's a constant conversation I have with myself. I know your, your daughter, one of your daughter, Ariel, was, went to Palestine a few times. She was denied entry. I can't remember the year. Was it through, in a way, Ariel that you became aware of Palestine or it's, the journey started way, way before? No, it was earlier than that, though. I became much more engaged as time went on. Um, it, it was actually quite a long time ago that I started to think about this because as it happens, I was born on a very particular day, which is the 15th of May, 1948, which as everybody knows is the, for Palestinians, the Nakba, the catastrophe, when they were kicked off their land. And for Israelis, the beginning of the Israeli state. So I didn't actually know about the Palestinian side of the story. I, I always felt this sort of relationship to Israel because it was exactly the same age as me to the day. And, and I was a big supporter of Israel in its early days. I can remember in the 60s and 70s being so impressed by many aspects of Israel. And I still am impressed by quite a few aspects of Israel. Um, but the kibbutz movement very much chimed with my feelings about, you know, it's one of these, another one of these wonderful human experiments that I started out talking about. Um, and it was a, a great, uh, a great experiment. Um, and it was only in my, probably in my late twenties that I started to realize there was this other story, which is the story of the Palestinians the people, the other people who lived in that country. So I, I was paying attention to that from probably the mid eighties onwards, I guess, something like that. I was, I was starting to become increasingly aware. However, at that time, it was still quite a different situation from now. For a start, most of the Israelis and most of the Palestinians had grown up together, even though there was a there was a sort of transfer of land going on and a takeover of power going on. There were still credible courts in Israel that that were not prejudiced inherently against the Palestinians. There were still quite a few mixed communities where Palestinians and Israelis lived together. So there was still some sort of sense of the possibility of a dialogue between them. What really changed is when Israel, I think, I mean, maybe a lot of things changed, but I think one thing that made a big difference was when Israel suddenly realized that for demographic reasons, they had to have more Jews in Israel. They were being out, outnumbered by the Arabs, the Arabic side of the population. And they realized they were going to be in a difficult situation where they simply couldn't outvote the Arabs if voting was about it or, or outfight them if fighting was what it was about. Um, and so they then made the famous declaration that um, any, any Jew anywhere in the world could, be, could move to Israel and they very much encouraged them to and made it a very attractive proposition. Um, so what started happening then is that you got huge waves of people who had never even thought of themselves particularly as Jewish often, but they discovered that they had a grandmother who was Jewish. Um, people who had no familiarity with, with the Arab population and regarded them only as the enemy. They didn't have any acquaintance with them. So these were just a problem for them. These were just people who were in the way 
They shouldn't be in our country, those people. We need to get them out. And I think the mood of hostility really dates from that. Um, and that hostility, of course, with the drift of the Israeli government to the sort of very far right, where it's been now for the last 15 or 20 years, um, where there was no sort of, no hint of social empathy left at all. And so the all the Palestinians were just some kind of obstacle that had to be dealt with in a way that they could get away with, you know, um, in international terms. And, and then, of course, you got the nation state law a few years ago, which suddenly put into print what had been happening really for the last 20 years before. Um, so suddenly Israel is the land of the Jews. Those Palestinians there, well, we have to kind of tolerate them because we can't get rid of them fast enough, but we'll make it so bad that they'll just leave. They won't want to be here. And I think that's been the strategy ever since. Yeah. And, and what's interesting as, as well, you've um, maybe I think you've mentioned the Amnesty International report that came out last week um, calling Israel an apartheid state. Um, And people maybe don't realize that apartheid, if you had some, some sort of ratings of crimes against humanity, mm -hmm. apartheid is maybe just below genocide. It's, it's yeah. a massive, it's a grave breach of international law. It's a massive war crime. Um, and, and what, again, I find interesting is that the amnesty report is 280 pages long. So obviously they really looked into it every aspect was covered, the law and, and everything else. But a lot of the response, I mean, not again, a lot of the response, but the attacks against Amnesty have been, again, attacking, you know, the messenger, not attacking the message. You know, mm -hmm. there have been Amnesty's anti-Semite, that's it. While 280 pages of facts are in this report. And, but again, I, I, apparently the New York Times didn't even cover I was reading like the New York Times didn't even cover the, the report. Um, so really? I'm always wondering, yeah, or maybe they did, but like four or five days later or something. Yeah. Um, I'm always wondering, it's a step-by-step -step process and, and I completely get it. But, and, but I feel, and I say we, and it's ridiculous in a way to say we, because I really don't want to go into this Are you for Israel or for Palestine? Because I, I don't even think that's a question, right? No, no. Yeah, I mean, maybe you can answer that because, you know, the question people ask you, are you pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli? But that's not the question, right? No, it's not the question at all. I'm pro both of them, actually. <laughs> I, I want both peoples to succeed and live happily. And I think it is not possible for either of them to do that in the present situation. Um, I mean, we always think how bad the situation is for the Palestinians, and it clearly is, but it's bad for the Israelis as well. They are not becoming better people going through this process. They're becoming ruthless. They're becoming callous. They're losing any sense of empathy for, for the other people that they live with. So it is not good to be either the oppressor or the oppressed. They're both bad situations to be in. Um, I mean, you can say, well, it's better for the Israelis because at least they chose it. But actually, people don't make those big choices in their life. You find yourself in a situation and generally you do what everybody else is doing. So, you know, I feel I feel sorry for people growing up in Israel now as Israelis carrying this, first of all, this story of their own victimhood, which is then used to justify making somebody else a victim. I mean, we all know about uh, Jewish victimhood and it's undeniable. You know, there's no doubt that some of the most awful crimes of history have been committed against Jews. And I can really, really, really understand why given that history, you might feel paranoid. You might feel, we've got to really watch out because this could happen again. 
Um, however, the strategy that has evolved now, the, this very right-wing strategy of saying, we'll just get rid of anyone who's potentially an enemy. That is not a good idea. That, that does not strengthen you. That makes you coarser. It makes you more violent, more vicious. And it doesn't really give you a very good life. It's like somebody who's permanently angry. Um, so yeah. I, I, as I say, you know, I, because of my <laughs> date of birth, this funny coincidence, I've empathized with both sides of this. I, I sort of see myself following this through my life year by year and watching what's going on there and seeing peacemakers consistently being marginalized. You know, people like um, Marwan Barghouti, a, a very, I think, a very good man. Yitzhak Rabin, I think he was a very good man. Um, both of them, of course, in some senses, trapped in their circumstances. So there's not as much freedom of movement in those situations as you think. But given the freedom of movement that each of those people had, I think they were both honorable, good people. Well, Rabin was shot by a Jewish man. And um, Marwan Baghouti is in, has been in prison for many years um, because he is probably the natural leader of the Palestinians. So that's the man they don't want out on the streets. Um, and there have been many other people, you know, um, Issa Amro is a, another nonviolent person who tried to do something good. Um, but the something good that he wants to do isn't wanted. And um, I, I was wondering, because you, you've you been quite influential also in, in contacting other musicians and uh, and actually engaging conversations with them artists or musicians around around this issue um i how hard it is because you in a way it's not like you want to convince someone or you want to force or feed something no. into into someone but i'm thinking that again now with the amnesty report i mean there was betzalem foremost human rights organization in israel then Human Rights Watch, one of the mm -hmm. biggest human rights organizations. But I think Amnesty is, again, one step above. And also because Amnesty kind of is also this like celeb organization. They've got like loads of... So I'm always wondering, and I'm not saying obviously that artists and celebs are going to save the world, but, uh, you know, because they have influence and they have a platform, it's good if they are on the right side, I guess, of, of yeah. history. Um, I was wondering if you think in in... I guess some conversations you may have with musicians that that this report might help a little bit because I know and we know uh, musicians that have said only a couple of years ago this is not apartheid stop saying it's apartheid yes but now Amnesty is saying it it's not Brian Eno or myself you know so do you think it could influence some people that yeah you know? I I think I think it was very very important and as I said, the attorney general coming out with that statement as well. I mean, you can't accuse him of being anti-Semitic. <laughs> he was the attorney general of Israel. He is not anti-Semitic. Um, so, and Amnesty, well, of course, you can always accuse an organization of being anti-Semitic because it's very hard to define who you're talking about when you're talking about organization. And, you know, it's quite possible there are some anti-Semites somewhere in amnesty it would be surprising if there weren't but the point is that is an honorable organization which we have all looked up to as being a sort of standard of justice in the world and if suddenly we're going to say ah but they're now they're attacking israel okay they're not a standard of justice anymore that doesn't work and i think everybody sees through that and and this kind of reflexive thing that the right wing in Israel always does of as soon as somebody says something that threatens their project they say oh they're they're anti-semitic of course they are well that's just looking less and less credible now 
And I think this is another tipping point thing. You know, once, once more and more people go onto that side of the scale and say, well, it smells like apartheid, tastes like apartheid, it looks like apartheid, I think it is, um, then the thing, start, the thing starts to tip in that direction. I mean, I, th I think there has been, there have been two factors working with um, artists, I think. First of all, the thing I said earlier, that the story has always been presented as very complicated. Oh, the history of the situation, you couldn't possibly understand it. It's so involved. Well, every situation is involved, actually. If you've ever tried looking into any situation, like how did that car crash happen? It's not simple. There's always so much going on. Um, but we still make judgments all the time. We have to make judgments because you can't just sit there saying, well, it's too complicated. I can't do anything. Sometimes you have to do something. You have to get into a car again and drive, even if you didn't really figure out how that last crash happened. Um, so you, we're constantly making um, assessments of situations and saying, no, this crosses the line. And of course, it's possible for other people to say, oh, no, but you don't understand. It's really much more complicated than that. But we can't just stop doing things because we don't understand them. It's in the nature of humans. We're always doing things we don't understand. And we have to be able to make assessments and judgments about them as they unfold. And I think in, in this case, the case of Israel, it's getting more and more easy to make a judgment about whether this policy and this philosophy of one nation state will work. It obviously isn't working. You know, we've got a place that's falling apart for at least half of the inhabitants. And I think, as I said earlier, for all of them. We started this conversation with music and I want to close it with music as well. Um, do you think that music can, can in a way capture the spirit of, of a time? And I'm saying this because we've been under this COVID pandemic for two years and a lot of creative things have happened. You know, um, a year ago, it was everyone on balconies, you know, mm -hmm. clapping and singing and stuff. But, um, but also, and maybe this is some kind of a side question. And um, I feel that I've, in a way, I've, I've missed out on music uh, because I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm 45 in May as well, by the way, one week <laughs> after you. Uh, but, you know, you're, in a way, I feel like when I listen to music, now, like the music that has influenced me and that is very old, I still yeah. listen to like, you know, whatever, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin and yeah. Nirvana, Rage. it's like 20th. And I'm talking to my kids and I'm like, wow. Oh, so I'm not sure if it's me, obviously not being aware of what's happening right now, you know? And I know also because, I mean, in a way before it was very hard to make music, you know, you had to have, now you can, everyone can make music on YouTube and with your computer and stuff. Yeah. So, um, but so yeah, it's, it's like two questions in one. Can music capture the spirit of the time? And do you think, you know, I feel like in the seventies, I'm reading a book actually right now. And I forgot the name of the book. It's about, uh, sort of the Velvet Underground, the the MC5, the Stooges, all this mm -hmm. period, and you are mentioned in the book. Mm -hmm. And I felt there was so much creativity, I mean, and shit happening, but so much creativity. And, and if you think of films in the 70s with like Spielberg having dinner with George Lucas and Francis Ford Coppola, and, and I, I, in a way, I don't really see it happening anymore. And maybe it's just my eyes are not open or I'm too tired and easy with other things but um anyway so that'll be my last rambling weird question <laughs> to you <laughs> so there is never one spirit of the times there's always lots of them and they're they're always sort of fighting with each other and um supporting each other there's lots of spirits in any time so i don't know what the german would be for that uh, a sort of multi-zeitgeist idea but, but I think when we listen to music, we, 
when you listen to a piece of music, you don't only hear that piece of music. You hear that piece of music in relation to your whole history of listening to music. So what you notice is a difference. You think, oh, that's so jagged. It's so exciting, that jaggedness. So jagged, or let's say rough or fierce, is a quality that you respond to. And you respond to it not in absolute terms, but in by how much it's different from what you've heard before. Um, and then another quality might be very smooth. Another quality might be really fast. Another quality might be super funky. Another quality might be really gentle. You know, these, these are all things, but they're all in relation to other things you've heard. So, so just like I don't believe there's an answer to the first question you asked me. I think, in a sense, there isn't an intrinsic quality in music. Um, now, I realized this when I lived in Bangkok, and I had been going around with this sort of, I suppose, um, slightly hippieish idea that music was all good. You know, it was all, you know, if we paid attention, we could appreciate all of it. And it was all somehow an expression of the eternal human spirit, if we could only understand it. Then I went to the Chinese opera in Bangkok. <laughs> the most baffling musical experience of my life. So baffling that I went back two more times because I just thought, what are they, what are they seeing? What are they hearing? You know, there'd be points when everyone burst into applause but nothing had happened. You know, there's two people standing still on the stage, like, and suddenly everyone goes, and I thought, I didn't get that at all. And so then I abandoned that idea that music is something intrinsic. And I realized that music is relational. That's the word to use. You listen to music in relation to your history of listening. So every new song you hear, every new piece of music you hear, is like the sort of latest sentence in a long conversation you've been having. And that sentence might just be a repeat of another sentence that you've heard before, or it might be something you've never heard before. And suddenly that has a lot of meaning. And often what meaning amounts to is saying a sentence that seems particularly appropriate to this moment. Jagged. Yeah, that's right. The world has become jagged. And I identify this now because of this music. Suddenly I feel that. I, yeah, this is the world as I see it as well. And when a lot of people like something, it's in a way saying, we agree about this world. We are in this world. It's a fake world. You know, it's music. It's not real life. Um, you can walk out and it stops. You can switch the record off. But while we're listening to it, we are sharing a vision of a world together. And we're sharing it and we're learning about it and we're understanding it and we're having feelings about it. And we can share those, we can talk about those feelings. But just by having them, we unite as a group of people. And that, I mean, that's a very short way of trying to tell you what I think music is about. But if you've got another hour and a half, one day I'll tell you the whole story. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Actually, I've got one last question. Um, by the way, any have you listened to anything recently that has sort of, so I'm not moved you, shocked you, surprised you? Um, because I think music is, uh, I mean, actually, maybe when you're, when you're younger, people ask you, so what type of music you listen to? Mm -hmm. And I always felt, I don't know, I listen to, you know, music touches me. I mean, you've talked in so many different ways that I yes. can listen to sort of trance techno because the, just the bass just drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. I can listen to pop music, you know, that my kids listen to because the something, and I can listen to something because of the words and the lyrics, right? But anything in the last, whatever, week, two weeks, three weeks, months that, you in a way discovered or that touched you let me think in the last well in the last few weeks i've been listening mostly to my own music because i'm i'm finishing an album 
or finishing some new work anyway. I don't quite know what form it will be released in. So I haven't been listening to much other stuff lately, but I think there is more going on in music now than any time in my life so far. There is so much fascinating new stuff coming out and it covers such an incredible range. I mean, it's like a, a nuclear explosion took place in the uh, late 50s and it just has been, it's like an expanding universe, you know, it's still expanding and it's increasing the speed at which it's expanding. So um, I don't know if I can answer your question with any particular examples. Um, some, some of the things that fascinate me, I find them on YouTube and they're, they're not even that famous or anything. They're, they're young people doing something sort of amazing. You think, God, why didn't I think of doing that? <laughs> That's when I know I like something. When, when I find myself saying, why didn't I do that? <laughs> it's a kind of mixture of envy and admiration. Um, I, I should, uh, I, I don't want to make any no, no, you don't names yeah. in particular because then I'll think, oh shit, I mentioned her, but I didn't mention her. <laughs> um, so, and yeah. people pick me up on that sort of thing. <laughs> Why didn't you mention me? You always said you like, well, I will mention one person who I really like. He's a friend of mine and, um, I've known him since he was 15 and I've worked with him a few times. He's a guy called Fred again. He's, he's a sort of, I guess people would say he's a dance music person, but he's very interesting example of a new kind of artist because he does everything on his phone and on his computer. He um, makes all his videos from his phone and he always involves people. He just starts talking to people on the street or on a bus or something, he records them. Then he starts doing things with what they've said and the um, ch changes their voices into songs. It's a beautiful project, the whole thing. And so, so homemade. He, does, he really does it all himself, but using a lot of friends around him. And he's got this little scene going. He was voted producer of the year last year. So he, he had a, he's had a lot of hits working with all sorts of other people. But his, his modesty and this idea of let's invite the whole world into the music, I think that is very new. And it's something that it reminds me of gospel music, actually. So in a way, it's very new and very old. The, the thing about gospel music, it's music designed for anybody to join in with. And that's kind of what the message somewhat of Fred's stuff is. He's, he's sort of saying, hey, any of you could do this. It doesn't involve big studios and lots of money. It involves your phone and a bit of attention, you know. So I, I could say that's one of the messages of music that is coming out now more and more that I like. It's people power music, yeah. you know. And you know, it's interesting because I think that what is maybe lacking in people in people's lives is is some kind of creativity, right? Yes. People don't have time to create anymore. And 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 you tend to forget what this sort of brings to you, you know, the, the process of creation. And uh, I was recently, like last week, invited to um, a choir uh, that was made of, uh, you know, it was from 16 years old to 100. Uh, so we were like 15, 20 of us, old people, because they are, they were, you know, mm -hmm. uh, young people, a few migrants, a few refugees, women, men, and, um, and obviously there were some leaders, you know, teaching us stuff, but hadn't felt that good for weeks. Yeah. We, and we didn't do much, right? It was very amateurish. We did the someone doing the boom, 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 the bass, someone doing, and someone's. But when you felt, you know, when you feel the process that sort of starts, that it starts working, right? You, you go, oh, there's something here. I can feel the, the melody, the music. There is this 
it's so powerful. And I think that's, you know, it can be a simple choir, you know, <laughs> to something very professional like you do. But, you know, it's um, the power of creation in a way. It's amazing. Well, you know that I have a choir. And yeah, did yeah. you know that I've had, I've yeah, had yeah. a choir we except in covid times we couldn't but we've we've met every tuesday evening for 20 odd years now 22 years or something but tuesday is choir day tuesday we meet on tuesdays choir. as well oh is so, it yeah. <laughs> yeah well it is the best thing in my life without doubt it's the thing i most enjoy and most look forward to and this is a group of people who aren't most of them aren't musicians they're lawyers or bankers one there was a boxer for a while and they're all sorts of different people um and the sense of community the sense of love that you feel for people in that situation and the humor and everything it's absolutely priceless i think if i was in control of the education system <laughs> i would have an hour of singing every day at least it is so physically and mentally good for you and I, I knew this for many years and then about 10 years into making the choir I read a um, a Danish study you know in Denmark they have very good health records of people so they track people for their whole lifetime really so somebody decided to look at um, a group of old people you know, all in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and to look at how healthy they were, and then to try to find out how, what lives they had led, to see if they could find anything in common, which people ended up healthy and happy in their old age, what kind of lives had they lived. The, the interesting result was that it wasn't to do with diet or smoking or drinking or exercise even, it was to do with three things primarily. The top three things on the list were dancing, singing, and camping. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, that is pretty great. <laughs> the three things that everybody likes doing, those are the ones to do if you want to stay healthy into your old age. So that, that gave me great faith in my instincts about singing. This, this is how you can expand yourself in every way and that thing you said earlier about people wanting to do something creative i so profoundly believe this and i think this whole horrible world of QAnon and so on that has grown up is actually a perversion of that people want to do something and all of their options for doing something good have been removed they for some reason or another they're not in a position to do them and so they end up doing this shit stuff on social media and i mean i saw a lady interviewed sorry this is going on a bit you can chop it all out i saw an american lady being interviewed and she she was saying oh yes um you know there's no doubt that the democrats are killing babies they've killed eight hundred and sixty thousand of them and they're eating them and everything like that and the interviewer says, well, how did you do, how do you know that? And she said, oh, I've done the research. And she said, what, so what sort of research have you done? Oh, it's on the internet. It's, you know, it's all there. You know, you just got to, it's, and I thought this is, she'd obviously put hours and hours and hours into this. So what that shows to me is that she had an appetite to do something. She wanted to do something creative with her time. She didn't want to sit just watching TV the whole time. She wanted to actually engage with something. And unfortunately, that was all that was available to her. So, so this is why I think lots of singing groups all over the world would really, really help. Once you start singing with people, you found your community in a way. And you stop bothering all this stupid nonsense about people being transported across the USA in furniture and so on. <laughs> uh, thanks brian I, I love the the way we actually closed and and sort of the circle we started with a question you know why are we here no. now we know right we're yeah, here now we know yes <laughs> to sing to dance and to go camping <laughs> so <laughs> let's do it 
That should be a political program. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, God. Any political party that said, this is what we want to achieve. We want to have everyone singing, dancing, and camping. I'd be behind them the whole time. I'd give them okay. all my money. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks, Brian. Really, I, I really enjoyed this uh, this yeah, conversation. Yeah, nice to talk to you, Frank. Cheers. Okay.